Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from March 1st, 2020. Join us for a study in Psalm 110 with Pastor Josh. I've really been enjoying our time in the book of Hebrews so far. I've been challenged, I've been convicted, I've been encouraged, and I've definitely grown in my understanding. And I pray and I hope that that's been the case for you guys as well. Uh, The big picture of Hebrews, as we've gone over many times, is to show these Jewish Christians and us that Jesus is greater. These Jewish Christians were tempted to return to Judaism because it would be more easier and more comfortable. But the author of Hebrews wants them to know that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the prophets. Jesus is a greater sacrifice. Jesus is a greater king. He's a greater priest. He's greater than your current circumstances. Jesus is greater. Now, in order to show that Jesus truly is greater, the author of Hebrews has either alluded to or directly quoted many Old Testament scriptures. And as we can continue our way through the book of Hebrews, we're going to see that that trend continues. And and one of the texts that's been quoted and and alluded to many times um, already is Psalm 110. As a matter of fact, Psalm 110 is one of the most, if not the most, uh, quoted and alluded to scriptures in all of the Old Testament by the New Testament writers. It is quoted by the author of Hebrews. It's quoted by Peter. It's alluded to by Paul. And probably most tellingly, it's quoted by Jesus himself. With all that being said, I would think that it would be profitable for us to take a little bit of a closer look at this mighty psalm. And while it's certainly going to be profitable to expound Psalm 110, to see how it's sometimes used in the New Testament, that is not the extent or even the beginning of its usefulness. What I, what I mean to say is that, is that Psalm 110's usefulness to us is not simply or only because it's quoted by the New Testament. Psalm 110 is, is profitable because it shows us, it tells us of Jesus, the mighty king, Jesus, the eternal priest, and Jesus, the judge of the nations. As we begin, let's get a little bit of context here to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 belongs to a category of psalms referred to as messianic psalms. These messianic psalms, they look forward to a Messiah that would come and and rescue and rule and reign over God's people. Christians recognize these messianic psalms being fulfilled in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, literally Jesus, the Messiah. The New Testament bears witness that these, that Jesus is the Messiah by attributing many of these Messianic Psalms, their fulfillment to him. And so it is with Psalm 110. As I said, Psalm 110 is one of the most quoted, most alluded to uh, scriptures in the Old Testament. As we will see, many of these quotes and, and allusions are specifically and intentionally attached to Jesus. As we look at Psalm 110, we'll see that its structure is basically three parts. In verses 1 through 3, the Messiah is put forth as a mighty king. In verse 4, the Messiah uh, as an eternal priest. And verses 5 through 7 describe the Messiah as a judge of the nations. And what I want to do is I want to handle each of those sections individually. And then what I want to do is I want to, after each section, I want to circle back around And I want to see how that particular messianic title or office or position is applied to and fulfilled in Jesus. So let's jump in. Let's behold first the Messiah, the mighty, mighty king. Verses one through three. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth, 
will be yours. The first verse here, the first verse of Psalm 110 introduces us to what amounts to three people or, or three characters that are kind of in view here. The distinction of the players in this psalm is, is pretty important. So follow me here. We have David. He's the author of the psalm. And, and the first two words that he writes are the Lord. And notice that Lord is in all caps. In English, we put Lord in all caps when the Hebrew word is Yahweh. Yahweh is the word that God used to reveal himself to Moses at the burning bush. Um, therefore, in the Old Testament, Yahweh is the identifying name of the God of Israel. And David continues, Yahweh says to my Lord, that is David's Lord. And we need to understand that this Lord, Lord in lowercase, is a different Hebrew word. It's the word Adonai. Adonai is also a name that can refer to God. However, it's not always used to refer to God. It can also mean someone who's in a position of authority or superiority. So for instance, David, <clears throat> he refers to God as Adonai at times, uh, but he also refers to King Saul as Adonai because as king, Saul has a position of authority and superiority. So what we end up with here is, is three people, right? We have Yahweh, we have David, and we have Adonai. So what David is essentially saying is this, Yahweh, God, says to my Adonai, so God or superior person, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. In this, in this very, very first verse of the Psalm, the messianic tone is already revealing itself. Yahweh is giving somebody that King David considers superior to himself a position of authority. The right hand communicates a position of importance, authority, power. How much more is that superiority and power when it's the very right hand of God? Yahweh speaks to this Messiah and he tells him to sit in this blessed position until Yahweh has provided victory over the enemies of this Messiah, placing his enemies under his feet. The Messiah's enemies are Yahweh's enemies. Often when a, a, a king would defeat another king in battle, they'd have that king brought before them and they would place their foot upon the neck of the defeated king. This was a, a demonstration of the superiority of the conqueror over the conquered. We see this in Joshua 10, 24. It says, and when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. The Messiah is victorious and his superiority over his enemies will be known. In verse two, David says, the Lord sends forth from Zion, your mighty scepter rule in the midst of your enemies. That's all caps, Lord. Yahweh will send forth from Zion the scepter, a, a mighty scepter. The scepter is, is a rule of a, uh, of a king. It's a symbol of the king's rule. A king would have a rod or a staff, a scepter that would symbolize his authority. We see here that the Messiah has a scepter. He is a king. He has a scepter and that scepter is going out, and it's not limited to just Zion. It says, uh, which Zion is another name for Israel. The scepter goes out from Zion into the midst of the Messiah's enemies. The Messiah's kingdom is not a limited dominion. It exceeds the boundaries, and even there, he will rule. The Messiah is a king. And in, in verse three, we see the people of this Messiah. It says, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Messianic king has a people that on his day of power, as the scepter goes forth from Zion, that will freely offer themselves to him. 
They will not be obstinate servants or reluctant subjects. These people of the Messiah King will be clothed in holy garments, garments that symbolize their submission and their being set apart. Garments that symbolize their devotion to this king. This last little verse, uh, line of verse 3 can be a little bit difficult to get a grasp on. It says, From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. I believe that the dew of your youth is referring to these people of the Messiah. They are being compared to the, the dew of the early morning, the, the womb of the morning. Why are the people being compared to dew? Well, think back to a time when you were camping. Most of us have been camping before. Um, you go to bed and everything's dry and then you wake up and everything's wet with dew. Dew is silent in its formation. It just kind of seemingly appears. You turn the flashlight on and then when you wake up in the morning, it's wet. Also, the dew covers everything. There's nothing that's devoid of the moisture. And so it is with this, these people of the Messiah King. As his rule goes forth from Zion, they will appear. They will appear and they will be a multitude. The simple picture is a people that offer themselves to their king, set apart, appearing as a multitude. So to quickly summarize these first three verses, there's a coming Messiah, someone who even King David sees as superior to his kingship. This Messiah has a place of authority at the right hand of Yahweh. Yahweh will subdue his enemies. The Messiah's authority and rule will go out from Israel to the rest of the nations. He will have a, a, a multitude of people who are set apart and willingly serve him. This is a picture of a king, a mighty king, a king whose authority and power are unequaled. So now that we've seen what Psalm 110 has to show us about this Messiah King, let us now look at these verses um, or at verses that are, are, are alluded to and quoted elsewhere in order to behold that Jesus is this mighty King. Chances are that the first verse of Psalm 110 sounds pretty familiar. It's directly quoted in multiple places by the New Testament writers. First is quoted in each of the synoptic, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, each of those instances are the same. They take place as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians um, are questioning Jesus in hopes of entrapping him, hoping that he will make a mistake that will show the people that have gathered that he's not that wise and he's not who he's claiming to be. Questions like, what is the greatest commandment? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? If a woman has been married to seven different brothers who each die one after another in the resurrection, whose wife should she be? But they couldn't entrap, entrap Jesus. He answers flawlessly. As a matter of fact, uh, the answers to these questions are some of the more popular or, or well-known verses in the New Testament. And I'd venture to guess that many of us know them. The greatest commandment, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry or are given in marriage. They couldn't entrap Jesus. So he turns the table on them and he asks them a question. He asks these men who take great pride in their, in their wisdom, in their knowledge of scripture. He says, the Christ, Messiah, whose son is he? And they answer confidently that the Christ is the son of David. The question that Jesus puts forth actually serves multiple purposes. First, it simply stumps them because when they state that the Messiah is the son of David, Jesus responds with this. How is it then that David in the spirit, calls him Lord. And then Jesus quotes verse one of our psalm today to them. And after quoting verse one, he says, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? When we looked at 
verse one just a few moments ago, we identified the characters of the, in, that, in this psalm as Yahweh, David, and someone that David calls Lord. Jesus, his question was simply this. If the Christ is David's son, then why does David refer to him with a title that the Messiah is his superior? Surely a son cannot be superior to the king. Jesus' interrogators were unable to answer. And the text says this, from that day on, no one dared to ask him any questions. Mission accomplished. However, there are other reasons that Jesus asked them this particular question. Knowing that they would say that the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David, Jesus would be, in fact, pointing to himself. By the time of this confrontation, Jesus has already many times been referred to as the son of David. This takes place in Matthew 22, this interrogation. Just one chapter before, in Matthew 21, we see the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And what are they shouting to him? They're laying down palm fronds and they're yelling, Hosanna to the son of David. In addition to Jesus pointing to himself as the Messiah by quoting this verse, he's also subtly pointing to his divinity. Think of it for a moment. A figure that is at the right hand of Yahweh, a figure that is greater than the king of Yahweh's people, a figure who will triumph over all of his enemies, a figure that will have an army of willing ser servants clothed in holy garments. This figure is not only a Messiah, but a divine Messiah. All of this is confirmed in other quotes of Psalm 110.1 in the New Testament. At the beginning of this series in Hebrews, verse 1 was quoted to show uh, that Jesus being at the right hand was greater than angels. Peter quotes verse 1 at Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 32 through 36. Listen to this. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all our witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father, Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You hear that? Peter quotes Psalm 110.1 and says that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, a divine Messiah. Brothers and sisters, verses one through three of this psalm show us a mighty messianic king. Jesus is this mighty king. He rules and reigns. He rules now and he rules for eternity. Ephesians 1, 21 through 22 says that Jesus is at the right hand of the father, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. Sounds familiar, right? It sounds a lot like verse one of our Psalm. Jesus says in Matthew 28, that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. At the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has arrived. Yahweh has given his son a kingdom and has given him authority over his enemies. He is truly ruling in the midst of his enemies. His scepter has gone out from Zion to the Gentiles. Jesus has, has a people that are willing servants, a multitude clothed in holy garments that have been made clean by his blood. Jesus is a mighty, mighty king. King of kings, Lord of lords. As I, as I was studying through and praying through this psalm, there was something that really struck me. Now, <clears throat> the purpose of these first three verses, without a doubt, are to put forth, forth this messianic king. 
but I would be remiss if I didn't pause for a second and point something out that I think is important. David's the author of the psalm, and he's king of God's people. There is no more important person at this time in the kingdom of Israel, and maybe in the world, than David. Yet he says, Yahweh said to my Lord. Do you see the, the humility and the submission there? There's a, there's a, he could have very easily just said something like, Yahweh said to the Lord, or Yahweh said to a Lord, but he says, my Lord. There's a humility and a submission as he puts himself under the authority of this Lord. And you may think to yourself, of course he did. It's the messianic king. But I ask you, how many people in the world today have refused to humble themselves before this king? How many people who call themselves Christians have given lip service but have not truly humbled themselves and submitted to this Lord? Brother, sister, have we truly and completely humbled ourselves and submitted to this Lord? When you strip away that you prayed a prayer once or that you've been coming to church regularly for a decade or you serve in this or that ministry, can you honestly say to yourself and with David, this is my Lord. Moving to, Psalm, to verse 4 of Psalm 110, we come to another description of this Messiah and his office of priest. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. The exposition of this verse is really quite simple and straightforward. But the truth of its impl implications are altogether breathtaking and extraordinary. The Lord, all caps, Yahweh, has sworn. The God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, has sworn. He's made a vow. He will not change his mind. This is a done deal. What has he sworn? that the Messiah, this coming Messiah, will be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Messiah who will be a mighty king will also be an eternal priest. The people of Israel, the original audience of this psalm, they were obviously familiar with the priesthood and the sacrificial system. Um, just to remind ourselves of, of kind of why God implemented this priesthood and this sacrificial system. God is holy, righteous, and perfect. Man, since the fall, has been tainted and marred by sin. All of mankind has rebelled and abandoned God. Holy God cannot be in the presence of sinful man. So in order to bridge that gap where, where sinful man could come near to a holy God, God pres prescribed a sacrificial system where the people of Israel would bring offerings and sacrifices to the priests who would, in accordance with a very detailed procedure, give these offerings and these sacrifices to God on behalf of the people to cover their sins and to worship God. The priests acted as mediators or intercessors between holy God and sinful man. Earlier in Hebrews, we spent a few weeks on this topic of the priesthood, as Jesus is put forth as the great high priest. I spoke much about this particular verse, verse 4, because it was quoted in Hebrews 5, 6. Psalm 110, 4 is actually quoted more than a handful of times in the book of Hebrews, many of those coming in our next chapter, chapter 7. The book of Hebrews is explicitly leaving no room for confusion, applying this eternal priesthood to Jesus. Jesus is the eternal priest. The sacrificial system has now been done away with. The Old Testament sacrificial system, the blood of bulls and goats, only covered the sins of man in order that sinful man could approach God. Jesus 
as eternal priest, has by his own blood perfectly and permanently removed the sins of his people. So, the, so that not only can man come near to God, but that God can come dwell in man. As I said, this is a very straightforward verse to interpret, but the implication of this truth is remarkable. It's beautiful. It's captivating. It's breathtaking. If you are a child of God, if Jesus Christ is both your Lord and Savior, you have an eternal great high priest. In verses 1 through 3, we, we, we are told of a messianic king. And in verse 4, we have an eternal messianic priest. In verse 4, this messianic priesthood is compared to Melchizedek. We're introduced to this figure, Melchizedek, in Genesis. He's described as the king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. Did you hear it? A priest king. This is significant because the original audience, the, the people of Israel, would be immediately taken aback by this fact that the Messiah described here is both priest and king. You see, the, the office of priest is reserved for only men from the tribe of Levi. And the king came from the tribe of Judah. It would be impossible for there to be an individual who held both of these offices, priest and king. As a matter of fact, in scripture, we have a few instances where a king tried to do the duty of a priest and there were extreme and dire consequences. In 1 Samuel 13, King Saul and his army are waiting. They're, they're going to go to war against the Philistines. They're waiting for the priest Samuel to come to offer a sacrifice on their behalf. King Saul grows impatient and he takes it upon himself to act as priest, to offer the sacrifice. Do you remember what happened as a result of that? Samuel tells him that God has taken the kingdom from him. Dire, extreme consequences. In 2 Chronicles 26, we read the sad story of King Uzziah. Uzziah became king uh, at the age of 16, and he ruled God's people for 52 years. One day, he decides that he's going to act as priest, and he's going to burn incense in the temple. As he's doing this, he's confronted by the priests, and they tell him, what are you doing? And immediately, before their eyes, he becomes leprous, a, a death sentence. As a leper, he was forced to live away from the people. And in the text says, uh, that he was excluded from the house of the Lord from that day on. The king excluded from the house of the Lord. Dire, extreme consequences for any king that tries to act as the priest. <coughs> However, as we see in Psalm 110, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is both priest and king. Jesus not only rules his people, but intercedes for his people before the Father. We must not miss the importance of this. The king related to God's people on a horizontal level. The priest related to, to God and his people on a vertical level. In Jesus Christ, we have both a Lord and a Savior. The Messiah acts as both king and priest. And in these final verses, verses 5 through 7, we behold a Messiah who is also judge of the nations. Verses 5 through 7. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nation, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. As we enter verse 5, I want to address something just for the sake of clarity, there are many reputable and great, wonderful commentators that interpret verse 5 when it says the Lord is at your right hand to mean that Yahweh and the Messiah have switched places from verse 1. In verse 1, we have the Messiah at the right hand of Yahweh, God. Some commentators see a switch here in verse 5 to where what is being said is that the Lord here 
even though it's lowercase, is God. And God is at the right hand of the Messiah. They have their reasons for that, and I disagree. Um, I don't believe this role reversal is what we see in verse 5. I believe what we see in verse 5 is the psalmist David speaking directly to Yahweh. In verse 1, David is speaking of Yahweh, and now in verse 5, he is speaking to Yahweh. The change of who's being spoken to or, or who's being spoken of, it, that's not uncommon in the Psalms. I believe that David is now di talking directly to Yahweh because he says that the Lord is at your right hand. Going back to verse 1, Yahweh tells Adonai to sit at his right hand. That is the position the Messiah takes, a place of authority at the right hand of Yahweh. Therefore, since we know from verse 1 that the position of the Messiah is at the right hand of God, in verse 5, we can safely interpret that David is talking directly to Yahweh because David says to him that the Messiah is at your right hand. I believe this interpretation fits better with the context of how the words Yahweh and Adonai are used. Uh, but more importantly, I think this fits better in the context because what we see in the verses that follow this are things that the Messiah will do. Here's a great thing, though. Whatever interpretation you take, it doesn't change the meaning of verses 5 through 7. God's word only has one meaning. In the latter half of verse 5 and in verse 6, David speaks of the things the Messiah will do. The Messiah will shatter kings. He will shatter chiefs over the whole earth. He will execute judgment among the nations. And that judgment will result in the nations being filled with corpses. The picture that these last verses of Psalm 110 give us is that of a judge. The Messiah, a priest king, will also be a judge. The Messiah will not be just a judge among the people he rules, but a judge of all the nations. The Messiah's rule and reign and power and authority and dominion are not limited to just those people that are in Israel or the people that have willingly given themselves to him from verse 3. His judgment extends to the wide earth. In our study here, we've seen this Messianic Psalm. We've observed how the New Testament writers specifically attach and apply this Psalm to Jesus. Unlike much of the preceding verses, verses 5 through 7 are not directly quoted by any New Testament writer. However, that's not to say that they don't find their fulfillment in Jesus. Much of the New Testament puts forth Jesus as a judge. And we see much of the same language and the same picture that can be seen here. And I want to take a look at a few of those verses that describe Jesus as a judge. In John 12, Jesus says that he did not come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus is speaking of his incarnation, where he walked among us fully God and fully man. In his incarnation, Jesus didn't come to judge, but to save. But make no mistake about it, Jesus is coming again to judge the world. John 5.22 says this, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, Jesus. And then a few verses later, in verses 27 through 29, it says, And he has given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There most certainly is a judgment coming. In Matthew 25, Jesus speaks of himself coming back as a judge. And this is what he has to say. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, the place of, of importance, but the goats on the left. The king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, 
into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. <clears throat> judgment. There are plenty of other references to Jesus as judge, but I want to take a look at one last passage here um, and notice how sim similar this sounds and how the picture is the same. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a picture of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and Judge, the Judge of the Nations. Psalm 110 ends in verse 7 where it reads, He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. After this judgment, the Messiah will be refreshed and his head will be lifted up in boldness and confidence. Jesus left this world with a crown of thorns on his head, lifted up on a cross. He drank down the cup of the Father's wrath for his people. But when he comes again, he will be lifted up in exaltation. He will take his place among his people, ruling and reigning for eternity. He will not be drinking from the cup of God's wrath. He will be refreshed and drinking from a brook. In Psalm 110, this messianic psalm, we are presented with a Messiah who is a mighty king, a Messiah who is an eternal priest, a Messiah who is a judge of the nations. Jesus is this Messiah. Jesus is the mighty king. Jesus is the eternal priest. Jesus is the judge of the nations. This is wonderful news if you know this Jesus. But frankly, it's horrific if you do not. If Jesus is your Lord, your King, if Jesus is your Savior, your eternal priest, you want him to be your judge. If Jesus is not your Lord and Jesus is not your Savior, you are his enemy. And we've seen what happens to the enemies of Jesus on the day of his wrath. Matthew Henry, a great English theologian and commentator, he referred to Psalm 110 as pure gospel. And he's absolutely right. Psalm 110, we behold the good news of the gospel. The gospel is that God is perfect, holy, and righteous, and you're not. You are a sinner who has rebelled against God, breaking that relationship with him. You are dead in your sins, and you are far from God. God cannot be in the presence of your wickedness, and you need an intercessor. You need a mediator. God has made a way for man to approach him through his son. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice and eternal priest. Jesus Christ is the intercessor. It is by his blood that sins are forgiven and intercession is made. Jesus is the king on his throne now and forever. His rule and his reign know no end. Make no mistake, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The day of his wrath is coming where he will judge the nations, his sheep to eternal life and the goats to eternal fire. As Matthew Henry said about Psalm 110, pure gospel. Do you see it? More importantly, do you know it? Do you know Jesus as mighty king? 
Jesus as eternal priest, Jesus as judge of the nations. If you do, I rejoice with you. Let us be a people who will willingly serve Christ, a people clothed in holy garments. If you do not know Jesus, this Jesus, please come talk to me, talk to another elder, talk to a Christian friend that we would point you in the direction of this Jesus. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.